So that was interesting. Um, I'm just going to start the thing and see who's on. We'll start up in like five minutes. We're live. We're early. So hello, everyone. Thought I'd get an idea of who's here. Let's look at the list. We're just going to talk for a minute. I've never done this before. I always just kind of start and it's like, oh, there's the official beginning. But today, I'm, we're starting up different. So we can maybe uh, just have a little chat. Dominica, thank you for your communication, by the way. Um, did you find the uh, Park Colorado Springs Brain Clinic? Uh, Marcus Ernst is a really cool guy there. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time with him, although it's been a couple of years now, but still, um, I'll tell you what they're doing with the concussion um, uh, patients is really interesting. In fact, they have people with uh, a, a, a lady named Dominica de Avala Russ. Uh, everybody, this is my partner in crime, my brother from another mother, mother uh, my hermano de otra madre, Russ Parker. Um, I'll introduce him formally here in a little bit. We'll be teaching together. Um, Dominica, I told her about something today because she was just curious. And I hope that maybe you were able to find this uh, place. They have uh, some things they do with uh, like high school, college, and actually the, the Broncos, Denver Broncos uh, concussions. So it's very interesting how he's treating those and the, the results they're having is, uh, I wish I could have the gyro stim. The gyro stim is, uh, like a quarter million dollar machine they have there. It's kind of like a big gyroscope, but uh, amazing. Belina, Helen Martins, James Hudson, Jennifer Keegan, Laura, Lulu, Luli, I'm sorry, Luli Lopez. You gotta get to Puerto Rico. Ah, code of COVID, man. Victor, mi hermano de otra madre, Victor. Mary, Mary's right here. Actually, Mary uh, is a physical therapist here in the Syracuse area who works uh, out of a place where I do some training, um, mostly at night, so I don't get to see her often. But uh, Mary is, we've talked a lot. Amazing. I'm glad you're here, Mary. Um, we're just, uh, for those who are just coming in, we're kind of just hanging and chilling. Usually I, I hit start at like seven, right? And I just, go and I thought maybe I would see who's here and say hi because I really want to let people know that we appreciate it when you're here with us because we want to share so that you can uh, either help yourself if you're a person living with PD or your caregiver physical therapist occupational therapist personal trainer movement specialist doctors whatever you know we have information to share but we also are always learning so uh Russ just told me something before we went live. It was pretty interesting that we may or may not talk about, but um, because there's so much to talk about, and I'm gonna wait one more minute, and then we're gonna we're gonna hit it and go live because uh, this is being recorded. This way, we can uh, send an email to everybody and anyone who came in late, came in late, or they couldn't show up tonight for any reason. Stuff happens, life happens, and we can email it out and see it tomorrow. Uh, Ronald is here. Hello, Ronald. So if anyone has uh, questions, I just want to start, before I actually formally start, didn't look them up. Okay, Dominica, I just got your message. Yeah, yeah, definitely look them up. Um, Laura, uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow too, Laura, um, if that's cool. A little project we're working on here. Oh, uh, Jane, no, you won't be able to see anyone other than Russ and me I'm sorry. I can make my face go away if you want, so you only see Russ. I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, what this is is a webinar, um, not a, a meeting. Although, I'll tell you what, it's 701, so we don't want to penalize those who are on time. So let's get started officially. So thank you, everybody, for being here. My name is Carl Sterling. I'm the uh, CEO, founder of Parkinson's, creator of uh, Parkinson's Regeneration Training. I started this many years ago. A uh, long story, um, which you can learn about elsewhere. Bottom line is, um, one of the things, that, and Jeff, my buddy Jeff, I have to say hi to Jeff because he is a co-producer and a musician who plays on the CD. 
this. And if you don't have this CD, folks, I'll tell you where to get it soon. Jeff Richmond, thank you, my friend. I'm going to show you a picture of Jeff right now. Right there. Uh, right there. So that was recorded, and, and right up here, too. So it's recorded in Los Angeles, Granada Hills, last year. Talk about that more later, too. Our mission is to help people. I've always wanted to do that since I was a little kid, as early as I can remember. I just didn't know how I would get there. I didn't know what to do, where I could do this and actually feel like I was doing something good. So it was a very long road to get here, and here we are. And now this program has taken off, and uh, Russ has traveled with me a lot around the country. I've traveled all over the world. I've been in, I don't know, 20-something countries teaching, and I plan to do more of that. After COVID goes away, I won't be doing as much, but we will get out and do some live things. But the, the bottom line is we, uh, we wanna help people. And so here, let's get into this right now. I'm gonna share my screen. By the way, this is being uh, recorded. I think I said that already, sorry. Um, one second. That's the wrong place. We're gonna go here now. I'm still not too good at this. I've only done, I think, four webinars as a host. And we are gonna start from the beginning. It'd be really nice if I had this ready when we started. Okay, from the beginning. And here we go. So I was just telling you a little bit about myself. I also started uh, you know, Parkinson's Global Project. We'll talk about that a little bit shortly. If you have any questions during this, please, Enter them in the chat box. And while I'm talking, Russ can take a look at the chat box. While Russ is talking, I'll keep an eye on the chat box. If you have questions, we'll try to answer them as we go. We will leave time at the end. I'm planning on going until about 8.15. So it's gonna be about 75 minutes total. That probably means it'll be 90 minutes, but I wanna to try to stick to 75 if possible because it's a long time. Yet we have so much to cover, it usually goes fast. Um, so, um, you know about me, enough about me. I'd like to introduce my dear friend, my uh, partner in crime here, the amazing Russ Parker. <laughs> and Russ has a unique situation uh, and, and uh, perspective that he brings to us because not only is he one of our instructors, but he's a personal trainer, an excellent trainer, and Russ lives with Parkinson's disease. So Russ, say hello. Hello everyone. Great to be here on another webinar. Um, enjoying this a lot. And I've been working with Carl now on these, uh, on workshops and projects. Uh, it's been like two and a half years now. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It kind I've of, of watched watched that, but... yeah. yeah. Well, we're gonna get hear more from Russ quite a lot tonight. As a matter of fact, you're probably gonna him, hear from him more than you hear from me. Be glad about that. Anyways, uh, let's move forward. Here's our goal. On the left, you have medical current, wherever you are, whoever you are, wherever, wherever have people in different countries who have a certain amount of knowledge and education and medical care, neurology care, physical therapy care, and education that is either uh, existing or lacking, or in some cases, for example, in Belize, it's almost non existent, right? South Mexico, I'm a Gulf Coast. Well, there ain't a whole lot going on as far as education on disease management strategies. And a lot of times it's even tough to find a neurologist to diagnose you depending upon where you are. So that I could talk about all day. On the other hand is functional life for the person with Parkinson's, all right? The person living with Parkinson's and let's, let's say caregivers too because caregivers' lives are affected. Families are affected. Work, workers may be, co-workers may be affected to some degree, but it's, it's the person with Parkinson's first. It's the people they're living with also. We have functional life for these folks, right? So in the middle of the current level of knowledge over here on the left, level of education, knowledge, care, between that and over on the right, functional life is what we have uh, this arrow representing, I call it the big gap. It's a void. Our goal is to uh, fill the void, bridge the cap, gap with education and intervention strategies. Now, we're not gonna talk about what is PD tonight. We've talked about it before. 
And you can find out about that on our website and a lot of other places. How might somebody uh, be affected by PD? You can find that out elsewhere too. What can you do to help? Well, tonight's a little bit about how to help when it comes to training for fall reduction and moving better. So we know that we can help, right? Fitness professionals, physios, OTs, caregivers, health aides, medical professionals, everyone. Anyone who's interested in helping can help. We want to fill this gap here. Now, before we get into stuff, let me just move forward and say that we have two events coming up. There's actually three, but I'm just not sure the date of the third one. It's going to be kind of a floor-based movement session based on something called animal flow, which is an amazing uh, strength-building exercise that we've taught in our workshops, but we do it only when Allison is with us. So Allison is going to join me for that probably early August. I'll keep you posted. July 29th, 7 p.m., two weeks from tonight. Same time, same bat time, bat channel, bat location here on this link. A webinar about music, rhythm, movement, and the brain, part two. Russ will definitely be with me on that. And then on August 8th and 9th, we're going to do the Zoom live streaming uh, version of our live workshop that we taught all over the world. It's normally like a two full day event where it's like, 8.30 or 9 until 5, 5.30. Uh, we're gonna go 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time both days with an hour for lunch, uh, a couple of breaks of probably 20 minutes each and we'll just sign off and then sign back in. We've done one and it went really well. Um, it went really well. So for trainers, it is uh, 1.4 NASM, 14 AFA CECs, Continuing Education Units. You're going to get about two and a half, probably now three hours of upfront education you have to watch before you attend it. And the price is half of the live workshop. So you don't have to spend as much money to attend it. And you don't have to travel to go do it. You don't have to buy a plane ticket or drive your car or rent a hotel room. It's $249. And um, you can register for that at Parkinson's Regeneration Training.com. We will talk about falls in it, but there is something I have to tell you that's very, very, very exciting for me, and that is that my new book is out. And many of you are familiar with the fact that I started writing this three years ago, and I took pre-orders two and a half years ago, thinking I'd be done in a year. Okay, well, I'm late. But guess what? It's here. And many of you actually have it now, because you got your pre-orders or you're ordered on Amazon. So it's the real deal, folks. It's actually here. Russ Parker wrote two pieces for it, one um, from the perspective of a person living with Parkinson's, the other as a professional who works with people with movement disorders. Um, the book is $35. Now, that may seem pricey, but I wanna tell you why it's that way. First of all, it's 483 pages. It took three years to write, and there's a ton of stuff in there you're not gonna find all grouped together in one place like you will in this book. Does it have everything in the world to know? Of course not. But there is a support website that as we keep learning and growing, that support site is growing with it. And it's organized. I'm going to show you real quick. Uh, it's organized by chapter. I'll just show you very, very quickly. When you go to the book support site. Oh, uh, yeah, right. OK, sure. It did that to me earlier today, too. Uh, well, here is what it looks like on the menu. Home, welcome, chapter one, two, three, four, all the way through chapter 19. You got drop downs for many of the chapters with uh, lectures, videos, and I have about 10 more items to add here because putting to this, this together has been uh, actually quite challenging. But bottom line is, it's there and it comes with this support website because I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to wait to release the book because I already waited too long. And I, part of the reason I didn't do it was health problems last year were very major. The other problem is I kept learning more and I'm like, I gotta put this in. So I had to stop putting new stuff in. Every penny, and I, I'm sorry if I'm sounding salesy, but this is very important for you to know. This is an educational uh, resource that, um, uh, everyone so far who has been giving me feedback is finding it to be very helpful, very easy read. If you know how I talk, you'll hear me because I wrote the way I talk. I have several contributors. Um, 
doctor, uh, a lot of different doctors here, neurologists, movement specialists, brain people, uh, movement experts. Um, and then in the right column are people with, with Parkinson, who live with Parkinson's. A lot of the names are very familiar, like Omotomo Thomas, Angela Bacardi, Russ Parker, Claire McManus, diagnosed when she was 21 in Ireland. I met her when I was there. Ian Frizzell, um, and many people. So, uh, but here's the thing, $35 gets the book, gets the free support site forever, and it's always gonna be growing. But I wanna, I wanna show you something that our mission of the foundation here that I started, the Parks and School Project, and I promise we'll move on, is to help, we've, we're gonna do research originally, we're not doing that. We are, give, we are donating and helping people to get medications. We sent $160 today to a family in Mexico City. Uh, we have a, a system for doing this, so we know that it's actually going to be uh, accounted for and used the way they put it. I also know this person uh, a little bit. Um, there is such economic hardship in so many areas, and we'll we'll do it within the states here. We just happen to be more in Latin America at the moment, and um, a couple other places in Europe, where the economy is so bad that uh, one one person that we um, helped here two weeks ago. The medications only cost fifteen dollars per month. They don't have that money. That's not disposable to them. They do. They won't have it. So send down enough to supply for one year. It was one hundred eighty dollars that came out of the foundation. Like seven book sale proceeds covered that one. And guess what? I get thank you notes every day. I don't need those. It's not about me. It's about we. It's about you. It's about us, it's about we contributing a little so we can get educated and proceeds all go, every penny, to people. It's individualized. I will not give it to research at this point unless somebody gives us a huge grant, because I'd like to do some research. So consider that if you haven't purchased the book, the 35 bucks is gonna help, it's gonna help somebody. If $15 a month, that would, uh, well, 35 bucks, yeah, it's two and a half months worth of medicine for this person. And I get thank you notes every day because she can walk better. Okay, that's enough of that. But please go to the pdbookback.com and invest in a copy. It's in Kindle format, paperback, and it'll soon be on audiobook. The audio is actually all done. We're just trying to get it uploaded to Audible, and then there'll be another option there. That pdbook.com goes directly to an Amazon link, so it's a shortcut. All right, here we go. What's our most immediate and primary concern for the person with Parkinson's? Well, that's the topic of tonight's webinar, and that would be falls. And I don't know why the word falls isn't on there. I did a new slide today. All right, but it's falling. There are much higher risk of falls and injury. They're twice as likely to fall as their peers or more. And not to scare anyone, because we are positive uh, people. We are optimistic. We are not, we're also realistic, but we also have to look at some real facts that the number one cause of mortality or death in the Parkinson's population are complications from a fall. That is so scary. When we look at the fact that they have twice or more the uh, fall risk of their peers in this study, you can, uh, I'm going to send the slideshow and the recording of this to everyone who registered, whether they're here, present, or not, so you can have this and go to that link down there and read this study. In this study, of the people who were in it, and I can't remember how many, 38% of people with Parkinson's fell down, 13% one, more than once per week they fell, 13% experienced broken bones, 18% wound up in the hospital, 3% became confined to a wheelchair. This is very, very bad. There are, uh, uh, Dr. Alfonso Fasano is a neurologist in Toronto. We did a, I did an interview with him about three years ago. He's become a mentor of mine. He's an amazing person, neurologist, he really cares. He talked about how, uh, he showed me a video of a gentleman that was, uh, you know, private, you know, it's not on the internet or anything, that the wife took, this gentleman uh, had passed away, but the, the re what happened was the gentleman was working in his backyard, he fell down, he hit his head on a huge rock, you know, it's like four feet high, and he got stuck between the rock and a fence, 
The wife couldn't get him out. He couldn't get him out. They took him to the hospital. A month later, he died of pneumonia. Statistically, and this is the only bad news I'll say today that's really scary, is that the number two cause of mortality in the Parkinson's population, statistically, are complications from breathing issues. And within that, it's pneumonia. Of course, now we got COVID, so we don't know how that's all going to be, but never mind that for now. We know that's bad, and that can exacerbate things too. And so falling is bad. That's the moral of this slide. And so uh, Russ and I are going to talk through a few slides here. We have fall facts. All right. Let's just go one at a time. If somebody falls, they are now called a faller. Okay. What you want to do is stay out of the faller category. You don't want to be a faller because once you fall, you're more likely to fall. I think because some of these things I may talk about ahead of time, I, I don't want to repeat myself, so I'll just show them all. Idiopathic fallers. Well, idiopathic means we don't know. They fall for no apparent reason. You, know, you just can't figure it out. Is it postural instability? Is it vestibular problems? Is it what? We don't know. And that, this comes from Alfonso Fasano directly. Uh, we have the relationship between depression and falls, depression being the number one non-motor symptom statistically for people with Parkinson's. Also realize that people with Parkinson's, although depression may affect um, a, a large percentage of them, not everyone gets depressed, nor does everyone get a tremor, nor does everyone get uh, rigidity, although it's very common. Uh, not everyone has cognitive decline, but typically uh, depression, well, Depression is common, number one statistically uh, uh, non-motor symptoms. So the question is, does depression call, cause the fall or is the fall cause depression? They probably is something like the chicken and the egg. Which comes first? Well, what happened first, depression or falling? Well, they probably exacerbate each other. Okay, That's, this is all in an interview that I'll include in the email to everyone as a follow-up with Dr. Alfonso Fasano. It's 74 minutes, so I'm telling you, he has a great slideshow he goes through in it, and he really explains all this stuff so well. Only 10% of falls are from weakness. So what does that tell you? Well, I can tell you this. I know that Russ is really strong, because if he punches me, I feel it. I know I've been punched by a lot of people with Parkinson's. I go, I, every day we do that. Strength is not usually the problem. It's the nervous system, it's the brain, it's the lack of dopamine, the lack of the chemical messenger, it's the freezing, it's the all this other stuff. Awareness of falling or the fall risk, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, the awareness, that, that's a big deal. It's a separate slide on that. Cognition, okay, so we can't process things quite right as to uh, how to react to a situation or a distraction or whatever, or an oncoming person or if cognition is diminished, will increases fall risk. Once you're a faller, you're more likely to fall. That should actually be the second one on the list. Fallers are people who fall. Once you fall, you're more likely to fall. We want to avoid the first fall. This is our goal with our training. Let's avoid the first fall, if at all possible. A single fall can be deadly. We already talked about that. Uh, a lot of other things, and this is just a partial list. Okay, there we could add 50 more things probably, but Dual tasking, multitasking, while moving, while walking. Well, that could be really tough and increase fall risk. Um, if we're phobic about falling, if we're afraid of falling, we actually may be more likely to fall because of the fear of it when actually if we, there's another slide on that, but phobia can add to fall risk. Reaction time, if we're processing slower, it's kind of like cognition. If we can't react quick enough to a situation where we need to move our feet fast enough it can lead to falls. Um, and also, you know, just in the general population, my mother fell down uh, two and a half years ago and broke her ankle and needed to have surgery. And, you know, she has no movement disorder, but just she's 81 at the time. Well, age related. Uh, eyesight can be a factor. There's um, uh, dopamine, which is the, the neurotransmitter that's diminished in production in Parkinson's. Um, that's present in the, the retina, right? So if the retinas don't have enough dopamine, there can be contrast issues and depth perception issues. And we could keep going with this, but Russ, any thoughts on this? 
Um, um, well, I would, I would say that, you know, like with anything, you want to improve on something, you want to set yourself up for success. And if you look at um, all the things on this particular slide, there's a lot of um, problematic that could send you down a slippery slope. So, you know, like getting depression and, um, and then being afraid of falling and all those types of things. So what makes it to, you know, stop being a faller is, is, is not knowing how to, like I said, set yourself up for success. So I think some of the key things are learning some, you know, learn the tricks, what to do, what not to do, and having uh, body awareness and getting to the point where you could start doing things to help yourself stop your, you know, from falling while doing it safely. That's a key thing because um, once you start being afraid of falling, you actually start becoming a little bit too safe. So, um, you know, we, some of the things we could go over today, you know, maybe you'll get some ideas of things that you could try that you'll feel comfortable with to start with. Some of the things are a little, a little bit more uh, complicated, but there's also ways to do uh, more difficult maneuvering with a little, some little tricks that, you know, make you feel a little bit more able and confident. So, so that's what I have to say about that in general. It's just in general. Yeah. And we'll get yeah. more into the nitty gritty as we go along. Yeah, and soon, because what we want to do is actually tech. spend more time on fall intervention strategies than about fall facts, but we need to get through the facts so we can get to some, uh, you know, have an understanding, uh, people have a, a, maybe an understanding that they didn't have previously. You may know most of this, but maybe there's a couple of things like maybe, you know, a lot of people don't know about dopamine and the retinas. Well, it's a thing, you know, when I learned it, I'm glad that I knew it. So I'm going to get a, as much as we can out tonight about falls. Uh, let's move on. Let's go to what triggers falls in Parkinson's. Well, remember, this is, again, a partial list. Lack of dopamine is a thing. Um, so the brain isn't sending proper messages to the body to move through the central nervous system because it's uh, dopamine neurotransmitters not making that communication. We know that uh, one of the five classic uh, motor symptoms is postural instability. Uh, in fact, postural instability, if you don't know the four, I, I just want to say they are uh, um, resting tremor or tremor. You may see a resting tremor, right? Um, uh, bradykinesia, slowness of movement. Akinesia is a newly recognized uh, motor symptom, and that's similar to bradykinesia, except that it's not necessary slowness of movement. And I think bradykinesia sort of has akinesia in it, but akinesia is you're standing somewhere and you're trying to get going and you just can't move. So we'll go over a little bit of intervention for that tonight. Sensory deficits, uh, postural sensory deficits um, can contribute to freezing of gait, fog. Freezing of gait uh, tends to lead to a higher fall risk because if you're stopping midway, but your center of your body keeps moving, but your feet got frozen for some reason. They're like glued to the floor. Your center of mass passes over your feet. Uh, rotations are a classic um, trigger for falling. Well, this is something you can trigger for. Uh, proprioceptive awareness deficits, you know, not having enough information coming in. So we have stuff for that, for sure. Uh, the poor posture. So if, if you're always, you know, forward, in your posture, which is a natural protective mechanism, by the way. I mean, it's natural to, to stoop forward as a protective mechanism. However, when you do it for long enough, your center of gravity is now adjusted to this new forward posture, but it's still not optimal. So the gravity can work against you and pull you down more easily. Um, the uh, next one is kind of the same, the postural control mechanisms. Anticipatory postural reflexes. This would be like, um, you, you know, I'm, this is me, I'm standing with my legs, and I know I'm gonna jump, and I go, okay, I know I'm gonna jump, and I'm gonna land here, so I go, boom, boom, done. Well, I go, boom, land, and I had, I had the opportunity, because it's an anticipatory thing, I knew I was going to do it. I brace myself, I get ready to land, right? We've been doing that all our lives, but sometimes that is uh, that is oftentimes diminished ability now. Um, then we have diminished reflexive stability. 
and I'm classic for tripping on things because I don't see out of my left eye at all. So I did it two nights in a row in Mexico, my last trip last year, and I was walking out of the same restaurant both nights with the same people. I walk out and all of a sudden, boom, I go down, I, I step off a curb because I'm looking over here and the curb's here and I don't have any vision here. So fortunately though, I didn't fall because my reflexes caught me. Now that was not an anticipated step down. That was a surprise both nights. You'd think I would have learned from the first night, but I was too distracted with other things. Um, and I, I actually, because of the vision thing, I tend to trip on things a lot if I'm not careful. But my reflexive stability saves me. So this is another thing that we we, we train for. Um, any comments on this, Russ? It, well, uh, first of all, there's a question out, out um, here from uh, Ed Bowman. He sees, uh, he's a person with Parkinson's and he also has a judo black belt. Has anyone explored the idea of teaching break falls to patients. And um, I'm not sure exactly what break falls mean, but I know we do, oh, yes, like, yes. we do dynamic type uh, uh, movement to simulate falling and that, and, that, and that kind of stuff. Perturbation training it falls, maybe falls into that category where you're actually pushing somebody off, purposely pushing somebody off balance. So we do yeah. stuff. Um, um, so first um, of all, Ed, I know we've been uh, communicating for a while here and there with postings. Thanks for being with us. and. Um, I have a question. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm asking. Did I meet you? And did we meet you in Austin? There was somebody with the last name of Bowman there. I thought it was a couple. But here's the answer to that. We have not been uh, uh, teaching that in the workshops. However, last year I did six months of um, martial arts for Parkinson's at a dojo here in town, and unfortunately. Um, two things happened. Number one, though, the first is Syracuse is a tough market, man. We and, and I'm the consummate optimist. I am always optimistic, but we could not get people to show up. Not enough to make it worthwhile. So I had to let an instructor go, which means I had to have less people with me. And that's a long story. But bottom bottom line is, um, I did it for as long as I could until I got sick with blood clots, and then I just had to shut it down. We taught those falls in martial arts. Now, not everyone could do them, um, like actually controlling and, and falling, actually on purpose falling in a controlled manner. And it's a wonderful way. It's a fantastic way to, if you're going to go down and you've gone down 500 times in the dojo or somewhere, you just know what to do. Your brain, it's not muscle memory, it's brain mystery, m memory. And that, Ed, I'm so glad you asked that because, you know, that's something we should really add to the program. Mm -hmm. So I'll add it to the book website with videos, but thank you because that that is a great one, Ed. Um, you know, I don't see the chat box, but uh, the, the other thing um, is you know along the same uh, you know uh, this topic uh, that we're discussing about the different techniques is that a lot of times um, people get locked into a small group of uh, exercise to do for a particular problems. So the media thing that jumps to people's mind a lot of times with fall prevention is balance exercise. They do a lot of balance exercise. Yeah. Uh, it's important to understand, you know, how the whole body moves in all different ways and, and all, and all different types of uh, capabilities are needed. So also mobile flexibility and all those things, they all tie into fall prevention too. Cause when you think about it, if you have extreme rigidity and you can't rotate and you start falling and that kind of rotational control and flexibility, uh, it's going to just increase the chances that you're going to, that you're going to go down. So there's a big interrelationship with yeah, a lot of the other things that we, you know, we train to rigidity it, and it gets really, movement, all that. Yeah. It gets really complex. And as we talk about these things, I, uh, and just, you know, Russ, add anything you want. You always know I want you to do that. Um, I see why we always always go extra in our workshop time because there's so much to talk about, really. There's so much to try to tie together. There's so much that years later I'm still doing this and learning every day, literally every day. So um, thank you, Ed, for that question. Expect to see something on my site soon and, and posting on Facebook. In fact, I'm going to reach out to you individually because I'd like to ask you a few questions about it, if you don't mind. Um, last slide on this visual depth. We had talked about that, uh, but 
in particular, when it comes to the visual contrast, the depth perception issues, classic things that can cause a problem are a doorway. And I wish I could see you and have you raise your hands. If you have PD or you know somebody who does, have you ever experienced going through a doorway or approaching a threshold, let's say, or a surface change in the floor, whether it's from carpet to wood or concrete to something and, or carpet to carpet, different kind of carpet, a threshold, of the slowing down three four steps before it's classic you kind of slow down almost stop because it's like yeah, i wonder you know where, where is the door frame exactly where's the threshold i don't want to fall down and you know and trip um and that would also go with moving objects uh, particularly i think people is a good example you're in a situation in a store uh, even with COVID, when we're social distancing, you can't stay away from everybody in a store, right? So somebody comes towards you, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's the lighting, too. I have problems with that myself, where it, the lighting is odd. I'm just I kind of like, you know, I'm going to stay here because I don't want to crash into that person with my cart. Um, it doesn't happen often, but it still happens. So that would kind of constitute some environmental factors, meaning with the environment you're in. And there could be numerous other things, too. I'm sure Russ can speak to that here shortly. Uh, neurological sensory disturbances, mostly vertigo, it's, it's very common. Rotations, multitasking, dual tasking, that kind of went over that. Um, orthostatic hypotension, yeah, that's where you get up from, uh, let's say, a seated position or even more so from maybe you're laying down. And now in workouts, a lot of times I have people on the floor. We're on the floor every every chance we get um well every workout so you know even if i know that they don't tend to have that drop in blood pressure once they get up that's what orthostatic hypotension is as you get up from seated or laying down position especially if you do it too fast and i actually experience this myself sometimes like about once a week you know binging on netflix on rare occasion on the couch and then i get up too quickly and i'm dizzy that can lead to fall risk. Uh, severe dyskinesia, you know, there are cases where, um, for various reasons, which is a whole nother workshop or webinar where somebody has, uh, if you ever seen Michael J. Fox, let's say when he's interviewed sometimes and he's moving a lot, he's either moving a lot or he's not moving at all is what he says. He's either frozen or moving a lot. But the moving a lot, the dyskinesia, at least it allows him to walk, but also can lead to falls. Um, Russ, chime in anytime you want. I wanted to uh, get through these next two slides and then we can start just talking about some things. Uh, yes, I'm asking about it. So our eye exercise is good and uh, we, do, uh, we do, I guess, vestibular exercises with, with the eyes and those, those uh, yeah. Yeah. The answer is yes, exercise is vestibular. Um, so one of the things that Russ mentioned earlier, and it's really important, is um, your belief in your ability to move versus your actual ability, actual ability to move. And there's a better slide, and we call it the fall spectrum. Okay, I'm going to go too far. I know I am. Yep. Okay. So on the left, this is a fall awareness, and I keep forgetting to add the word awareness between fall and spectrum at the top. I need to do that. Um, Fall awareness spectrum. How aware are you of your likelihood of falling? Are you likely to fall and you don't know it? Or are you unlikely to fall, but you think you will? So fall phobia would be, that can be very dangerous. And it's just not good for your health because fall phobia leads to more sedentary lifestyle. People with fall phobia typically overestimate their risk of falling. Uh, I'm working with somebody who's working on this right now. He thinks he's going to fall, but he's, he never falls. He has never fallen. And so he's not going from the experience of some falls or a fall. He just thinks he will, but we're, we're trying to get him to believe more in himself. But, you know, it's so complicated, but we're doing our best, right, uh, with th different exercises. Now, on the other hand, you have reckless gait. And I have worked with people, one person in particular, particular, I love her, she's great. She was, I think, 85 or six when I met her three years ago, four years ago, and she has no tremor. 
no rigidity, no bradykinesia, no akinesia. She has postural instability, which typically is a little bit later stage in the disease, but this is her first motor symptom. She'll just jump up off, you know, move really fast, and go and arm swing and everything, and boom, she goes down. She engages in uh, higher risk activities because she under underestimated at the time. Different now for her, it's different now. She's learned that she may fall, so she's being more careful, but people who are rec uh, um, uh, have reckless gait uh, fall into that category, typically underestimate the risk of falling. All right, so the bottom line is, if you look at my cursor here, hopefully you can see it, the little arrow. We want our awareness of our likelihood to fall to be right here in the middle. We don't want to be phobic so we don't move, and we don't want to be reckless so that we uh, fall. All right, there's the self-administered test. I think it's, it might be 16 questions. When you get the slideshow, you can go to that link on the bottom and you can get it. You just answer the 16 questions and it will tell you, it'll give you a score of your awareness of your likelihood of falling. So this is really important. Um, before we get into, I'm gonna turn it over to Russ in just a second. Um, for the professionals out there, moving professionals, trainers, physios, OTs, uh, especially, especially if you're self-employed or your income is based on how many people you see. For a lot of us, that's how it is. Um, implementing standardized fall risk assessments can help to build your referral base um, and your business. I will just run through these and then turn it over to Russ for a bit, and then we'll just kind of uh, go through some things together. Uh, but before we go through these assessments, actually, and mention them, Russ, do you mind talking about the timing of edit, ed, uh, medications in reference to uh, exercise? And that would include assessments, too, because we don't want to assess somebody when they're in an off period and their risk of falling is higher. So take it away, my friend, and I'll be right back. Go, go for it. Yeah, well, the, the reason why a lot of people, you know, start taking medication is to um, you know, to bring, to bring back their quality of life. So that's, and that's hopefully is, is, is for a good part of the day for you. So I, I think you want to, you know, one why you want to, you know, be assessed while you're, you know, while the medication is on is because that's, that's the way you know, that's the way you normally live. Um, and, it, you know, it's a given things like, like Carl said, that you'll have postural instability or, or all sorts of other symptoms or your symptoms are worse when you're off, uh, you, you don't want in addition to it being assessed, you know, you don't want to train when you're in a off state, especially if, if your movement is really highly dysfunctional. Um, what could happen is a couple of things, you know, it'll be, it'll be unsafe for one possibly. And the other thing is you could actually reinforce um, dysfunctional movement, make things worse. Um, when I get up in the morning, um, you know, I haven't taken medication yet, and I'm off a little bit, but not not as much as if, like, I missed my medication later in the day. So I do a little moving around uh, when I'm off, um, especially if I get up early. I don't, I don't want to just take my medication just because I got up, you know, sometimes I get up an hour early or whatever. So I have that capability. But you want to be, you know, you want to be, you want to be safe. You know, if you don't have that comfort uh, in the morning taking your, your med, you know, either go back to bed, sit down, or or, or take your med early, you know, maybe take your med a little earlier or whatever. But, um, but you know, that's that's it. Um, yeah, we, we're going to, we should be getting into some demonstrations soon, I guess, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to go through real quick this I tell you, actually, the only test I'm doing any more of these, but any of these are good because they come, they're, they're on the website that comes with the book. Guess you have to buy the book. No, you can find these anywhere. I mean, you can find them on YouTube, but I picked out special and made special videos of this because I want to make sure that they're uh, taught correctly in the video demonstrations. And the one that I do is a Berg balance scale because uh, that and the mini best test takes a little longer on that, but it's like 15, 20 minutes usually. And this way you get us, uh, you go on the, the, the book website or uh, Parkinson's Regeneration Training.com uh, 
might have these. I can't remember. Um, and download the scoring sheet and then the instructions. And then you go through like the 14 items on Berg Balance and there's a scoring system. I, I think the top score is 56. So, you know, if somebody gets like a 38, well, they're definitely at a risk of falling more than somebody who's at a 50 or 51 or 52. So the thing is, is I do these before my each client about a week before the uh, patient goes to the neurologist and say, okay, let's do it. Do it, do the score, say here. And here's a little note from me. Give these things to your neurologist. Now it took like two years to get a referral, but now I'm getting referrals. I just got another one yesterday from Dr. Berry. And uh, you know, they, they know that we are doing things and they're seeing that a lot of uh, improve, you know, sometimes it's a slight improvement in movement. Sometimes it's a significant one. The bottom line is when they realize that you're doing things to help them move better, they're gonna refer more people to you, hopefully, right? Um, so you know what, at this point, let's talk about, let's get rid of this slideshow. Let's go to a full screen. Um, sorry folks, I'm still not the best at the thing here, but Russ, um, you and I talked about doing various things. Um, where do you want to start with this? You had some great ideas. We're actually going to improvise slightly, but we've done it a lot of times, so we'll be okay. Don't worry, folks. I like, uh, if I can lead into, um, one of the things I find is really interesting is, in fact, I'll start with this and I'll let you take it away, which means I am going to share the screen because I want to show something. For a person who gets up and has difficulty getting started, well, I'd like to show you a video A video that uh, we were using, let's see, um, targets. Um, very, very sadly, I just found out this gentleman passed away. Um, Allison and Ruben and I met him in Denver and we just had the best time. Now, if, if you watch right now, you're, you see he's walking on some dots, but I, what I want you to do is I want you to look when he gets to the end of the dots. What happens at the end is what was happening in the beginning before I started the camera rolling. Now, he does a rotation, but look at his head position. He's carrying the bar because we wanted to have him do a couple things, but bar or no bar, he was having a terrible time. Look at the very, very, very small steps, tiny, tiny, tiny steps until he hits that dot, then watch what happens. Boom. Boom. What we see is important, but what he felt was epic. He was so happy. So with that said, uh, I'll stop sharing the screen now because, Russ, do you mind talking about that? Because there are some, some things going on in that video that are common when we use targets. Like I will use a target, you know, sometimes three or four steps from commonly traveled pathways like the recliner to the kitchen the kitchen to the bathroom the bathroom to the and like maybe four dots um i'll have the people put out so that when they see them they can just step and go and then they get their stride going but what's happening is they're looking down and we know that we don't always want to be looking down um any comments on that my friend well yeah when we, when we use them at first i i think it's you know it's those dots for, 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 for getting started, um, setting your stride length, you know, like you mentioned, the stride length was good because he was hitting the dots every time the dots were, um, you know, placed at a certain distance as opposed to when he didn't have any targets. He was just, um, you know, the, the Parkinson's kind of took over a little bit more. The dot kind of like as a, as a distraction and kind of make it easy his brain is thinking step on the dots as opposed to all the different little maneuvers you have to do with your legs to, to get from point A to point B. But like you said, um, so what, what, uh, as far as looking down, eventually you might want to get to the point, like I've used the dots before with clients, 
um, uh, you walk for a little practice, walk for a little while, practice on it, then try to pick your head up and not use the dots and still keep that, that long, long stroke. So what happens though physiologically is um, if you get into a habit of looking down, not just when you're using dots or whatever, is um, proprioception, which is your body's awareness of the environment around you and, and, it, and it helps you move. Um, when you're looking straight ahead, not looking down, that proprioception um, kicks in and, and your awareness of your environment, you know, it, it, help, it helps you move and stay balanced and move forward. If you sit down at your feet a lot, you take a, you don't need that skill anymore. But that's, that's kind of like a, a bad thing, though, because um, it'll create more situations where you'll, you'll be un unstable because you're kind of losing a skill. Uh, so so that, that's just my comment on the dots. Um, they're, they're, and the targets too, um, you know, could be used dy dynamically if you're, you're if somebody's out somewhere, somebody with Parkinson's, and they can't move. You could throw down a coin, business card, or, or something, or make a target on the on the ground, and have them uh, have them step up, step on that to to, to get them going. And to uh, he called he called me from uh, from outside because he got stuck. He couldn't move. He called me from his cell phone. I came out to get him and to get him going. I, I, I went out there. I didn't have anything on me. I actually just put my hand down, and he and he stepped over my my hand to use that as a target. My arm, but um, yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, you know it doesn't have to be a, a dot like we used. I just happened to use those, but we've used pieces of tape. We've used you know little little pieces of tape. Um, I know people who have pathways in their house houses taped. And it's actually helped quite a lot. And it's, it's really more of a training thing to get the feel for what it is to take a longer or more normal stride. I mean, that's just part of it because when we're looking at gait, um, where are we here? Yeah. We're also wanting to look at stride length, stride symmetry. Is it shuffling posture? Is there um, reciprocal arm swing, you know? Are your arms swinging? Like if my right leg goes forward, is my left arm going forward? Is my trunk rotating slightly too? Is my hip rotating on the other side? Um, are we walking in a straight line? Doorways, thresholds, um, how do they do on those? Where's the, what's the head position? Where are the eyes looking? Uh, of course, examining rotations, turns. You know, I have to just kind of, yeah, yeah, I put one slide too soon. So getting started, um, targets can be very helpful. I think it's a great starting place because think about it though, like walking is the most functional movement for most of us every day, right? So I had a gentleman in um, Detroit a few years ago who he was ex-military, career military. And he said he would think, uh, he would either do this, he'd either, be standing and then take a step backwards and then move forwards. Because he couldn't go forwards, but he could go backwards. Or I've had people say I can go backwards or I can go sideways. This, this gentleman could do the backwards sometimes, but if that didn't work, he would think of the, uh, the marching thing. Like, two, three, four, walk, two, three, four. And he, he did it in front of us and it was great. Every time he froze up, we'd heard him start to say that. Now, other people started using it at that workshop, and some of them got going without needing a target. So it's finding ways to trick the brain to make the body move, uh, counting, or just a rhythm, you know? Think of a rhythm in your head, or a metronome, or music, or marching like I just said. Getting something going in the brain that you can and go might be too fast but slow it down right slow the song down slow the metronome down i do this for people i'll just clap for them and then boom before you know it they step on one of them yeah, so it's, it's uh the, 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 um i just want to add you know that that whole thing with going to a rhythm uh, is important especially for people who have tend to have that 
um, Lee fast festination of gait, if you could learn to control that, and you could do that with music and, and, and a rhythm, um, that could that could really help you. Do you, do you mind sharing yeah, about that, me? Russ? Because I've um, we talked about that recently, the festination, and I know it's something that you've experienced, but a lot of people don't know what the word is. They don't know what festination is, and um, you mind explaining? Yeah, that's like um, uh, it's it's basically a stu stutter stutter a little different than I guess Parkinson's shuffle. It's like a stutter step. I could even just demonstrate. It's just when you start, and it usually happens when you move for a few steps, and then all of a sudden, yeah, it's happening. And it's and it's not not a good thing for falls because a lot of times what happens is you start stuttering, and then your your feet get too close together, and you become a uh, so we've used music therapy for that uh, and dance for that. And I, I know when, I, when I'm off, my medication is worn off a little bit. Like sometimes when, um, I don't, you know, I don't move too well or, or in the morning and I get a little bit of that fascination. And I think now I think back to the exercise, the, the music exercise, which uses a very slow controlled tango rhythm. And yes. I actually play that, I play that out in my head. So instead of walking, walking, blah, 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 I think to myself, and step, and step, and I'm thinking of that song, you know, that music and that rhythm in my head, and it, and it actually helps. Um, you know, we have to try. I have an idea, Russ. The idea is we were going to do a little bit of that today, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to prepare to get ready? While I talk about a couple other things, then when you're ready, I'll enlarge the screen. Do you want me to demonstrate the, the tango rhythm thing? Yeah. Okay. Or if, okay. if you need if you need time, I can talk about something else. No, it's okay. Okay. Well, this is going to be fun. Connected to connect the Bluetooth, and I got the playlist up already, I think. Uh, so I have another question here, and then I'll enlarge the screen. So thank you, Sylvie. That's actually a really good question. Could he walk with a visual in front of him or on a wall? Or did it need to be visual stimuli on the floor? I have never tried uh, anything other than floor because I, I need the foot to have a target. How, uh, at least, it, I'm not gonna answer this the way I want to. I won't find the words quickly enough, but it's a really, really good question. And Laura says, yes, yeah, she's ready to tangle. All right. So we'll do that in a minute. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen for a minute because let's just talk about what Sylvie asked. And I think it's a great question. It's something now I want to experiment with. I have seen um, people put uh, like a, an X. Uh, in fact, it's, it, there's one in, in the book, but it's for a different reason. You go to the book website, you allow them to download this big X and put it on the wall, but then it becomes like a a, a petty key partner, right? Lower, right? You know, you have four, four targets on an X, but an X can also be used uh, for a visual stimuli of cross brain stimulation. And I've been through this many times. The most amazing experience I had with this was in Ireland a couple of years ago with Dr. Ryan Foley. And uh, Laura says the X helps. Yes, yeah, so an X on a wall in front of somebody at eye level, okay, not, stooped posture level hopefully but also remember this about posture it's very important i need you to take this into your mind you do not want to take a person who's stooped over and then bring them back up right away with any kind of stimuli like you know uh um taping let's say they're using uh i don't have yes i do maybe i use this stuff all the time but you have to be really careful when you're posturing uh taping for cueing. I can't do it for pain, it's not in my scope, but I can do it for cueing. It's an external cueing sensory input mechanism. If you put stretch on somebody's back and you bring them like whoop, they're very likely to fall backwards and that's the worst kind of fall because they can't adjust to new center of gravity that quickly. So, bottom line though is, with the X, I know I, sometimes I get off track, but I know exactly where I am. I'm coming back to this X thing. We wanna have it where they can come up a little bit have the X at eye level, look at the X and go. And actually the X uh, above a doorway has helped to get people through the doorway or an X on the floor on the other side of the doorway has also helped to get people to step over and not freeze up at the doorway. 
So Russ, I'm gonna pin you and make the screen large. And let's to go through a little bit of movement with Russ, all right? There you go, buddy. It's just on what you were talking about, there's also the category of, you know, actual training, not just helping somebody move. So I mean, when we do vestibular training, we do do look at stuff like, you know, with our heads level, you know, turn our head one way and, and you can look at a target on things like that. So it's... I'm interjecting for one second. Um, Sylvie also says, so yes, start, um, good point, have them adjust back slowly. Yes, and that didn't come from me. I didn't make anything up. I don't know that enough to make anything up, but I did learn it from Dr. Alfonso Fasano. And in the interview that I'll include in this uh, email that goes out to everyone, or in the email, I will include that interview where he talks about this. And he talks about it very specifically how important it is to adjust posture slowly. Go for it, Russ. Let's do it. In fact, hey, everybody, does let's, let's, there's nothing, no way better to learn than to actually do. So stand up. I can't see you. I'm going to just assume that we're going to stand up right now. I'm going to join you. We're hey, going to so do this. This does a, a little bit of a little bit of everything. Um, it's, a, it's a little dance routine, but it's mo it's mostly the kind of exercise moves. There's not really that much dancing in it. The music's just used to kind of control your tempo. And I use this. I like using this tango tempo because it's got a strong accent. So we're going to do some exercises um, to get a little bit of uh, st stability and strength. So that's going to be a lunge. Uh, we're going to do once you're going to step to this side and step to the other side uh, a couple of times and balance on one leg. I'll show you the um, easy, harder version and easy version of these things. You can work your way up. And then we're going to also work on rotations because uh, that's something that you could, that could throw you off balance. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be doing a step bracing over your legs like this and try to do it very slowly. So that, um, creates a, a challenge with controlling yourself. So let, I'm gonna do some maneuvers and then we'll, we'll try it with the, with the music. So with, um, what's gonna happen is we're gonna do every other round, it's gonna start off with these side to side bounce, then they're gonna be followed with some forward steps, but every other round it's gonna be a different thing. We're gonna do two things. The first one's gonna be a lunge, and then when we come back to do the next round, we're doing this, this, uh, this rotation. Awesome. So the first step that we'll do is, and when um, I do this music, I'll just cue you by saying, uh, one, two, three, four, six, ready, go, and then we'll step. So you're going to step to the side and balance up on one foot. Now the modification on this is something called uh, um, stand. So you can just step and just, if you can see, I'm, my, my toe is just touching down. So I'm just really stepping and touching like this. So it's going to be... Balance, two, three, four. Balance, two, three, four to the other side. Let's do another one. We're basically staying in place and another one, okay? And we're gonna, do, let's first time around, we're gonna do a lunge. If you know what a lunge is, it's basically just walking, but stepping out, stepping out with a big step and, and you're dipping the other knee towards the ground. And again, on the modification on this is if you want, you can just walk in a straight line with your arms out or you could lunge deeper. So you're gonna step out and control like this. And then when we do the next lunge, you're gonna bring your hands together and step again. So a little bit of coordination there too with the hands. It's gonna be. So as, as you get. Side. Yeah, okay. Side, side, side. And lunge, 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 lunge. Okay. Everybody got that so far? Yeah, um, I have a question. Can, can some people make a comment and tell me, can you see Russ in a large screen? Because I haven't pinned. And I have a question, Russ, I want to ask you. Could the cross-step training potentially worsen a minor scissoring gait in a patient with multiple system atrophy? Well, I'll tell you, I've worked with people with MSA, and that ain't, that ain't a pretty thing. Okay, so... Luli, you can see Russ in a big screen. Oh, oh, I'll stop talking then. I get it. Yeah, no, I'm going to mute myself when Russ goes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, okay. Crossing, of course, want to be safe. So uh, I'm going to go over that now. Um, what the oh. on that will be as well. 
So we, we did um, we did the side steps and the lunge. So now we're here. We're going to end each when we get when we get up to this position after the lunge or after the crossing steps. It's always going to end with this. It's going to go with a little bit faster tempo. And the skate just goes like this. You're moving from side to side. Skate, 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 skate. So if you're kind of like walking backward and your your feet are going to the side like you're skating. And then that brings you back to the this point, and then I say one, two, three, four, five, six, ready, go. Now the next thing we're going to do rotations. We're going to do the four side steps first. Always one, two, three, four. Now you're going to step across this count. You're going to be bringing your foot up and very slowly controlling, and then you have to step across again. This is difficult. So the modification for this would be. He just walks straight ahead and walk like on a tightrope. So we're going to do four of those. So it's going to be one, two, three, four. And then we're going to go back with the skate again. Skate, 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 skate. And then I start you again. And then we do the, the sides and then the line. So, we don't time. so I'll try to remind you as we're going if I could fit that all in with the counting. So let's do... Um, Let's do one round with the music, and I'll just stop for a second and see uh, see how you're doing with that. Just, just like, right before you do the music, um, just so everyone knows, I did pin Russ. I don't know why it switches to me, so I'm going to mute myself. There are two things I want to say. I'm going to address the MSA question after this, towards the end. I also want to just remind me, we need to talk about polls, in particular, Urban polling, the activator polls uh, are something that I use. Mandy Shintani at Urban, urban Polling. Um, we're going to talk about these as a, a mechanism for improving movement, walking, dancing, and everything. So I'm going to mute myself, and Russ is going to take over. Go for it, man. Okay, and um, you could. Uh, this could be done, of course, without music too. Um, did anybody, does anybody have any issues? That I, hopefully I gave enough modifications so this, and you, you practiced this a little bit as I was demonstrating. If any, if I'm just gonna look for a second. If nobody types anything, then I'm gonna continue. We're gonna try this with the music. Yeah, my advice is always just do what you can, not what you can't. And yes, I'm muting myself again right now. And even, even a further level of stability is you could have a few chairs nearby. Told so if, you, if you need that as well. We try to also try to look straight ahead. So I'm going to get the music going. Give you a chance to listen to it. Now you can hear that, that sound there. That's the accent that we're going to go on. I'm going to start this way first. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ready, go. Step to the side and bounce. Step to the side and bounce. 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 Lunge. 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 Now, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, ready, go. Left. To the side. To the side again. To the side again. Lunge. 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 And one, two, three, four. Now we're going to do all the... In a second, we're going to do the uh, the rotation. Into the rotation. And one, two, three, four, five, six. Ready, side, 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 side. Now we're going to do this rotation. Rotate, 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 rotate. and skate, skate. Skate, skate. Let me pause for a second. I can give you one more modification on the rotate. You just step and then just tap your foot and then cross over. Step, tap, tap, cross over. Step. That's easier. So let's do one more, one more round with the lunge and then the uh, the rotate.
having some problems myself on the road those rotations are difficult to get yeah. your foot up in the air and keep control and, and balance we have a comment of some somebody made them short of breath um first of all i hope you're okay and it's not too much but that just goes to show that there are lots of different things we can do to uh i'm going to unpin you for a minute russ and go back to uh Oh, if I can figure out how. Here we are. It it is right. It's a workout, and we just did a little bit here, so it's really cool. It's it's just I love it. Um, we have um, a question. One comment I can make on that on on the uh, if you ever do that's a circuit, a series of exercises. Yeah. So with the out of breath thing, what we could you could, there's so many modifications you could do on that. You could you could go you could stop. Him. Half weights. In this case, that doesn't really apply that much because we're not like doing 20 repetitions. We're only doing like four, so it's kind of hard to do that. But you could skip around. Um, you could go slow, lower indications. Um, so there's a bunch of things you could do. But if you ever, if you ever, with these dance things, if you ever do like stop and skip around, just put up back at the be at, at the beginning. Find out where the beginning of the routine is. Don't try to like step in in the middle. That's that's a lot harder. Okay. Russ, we have a question from Sylvie. I love this question because uh, I have I found myself using my arms differently. Uh, do you cue to use arms? Sometimes arms are against the body. Sometimes they're out. Yeah. Um, well, my intention with the, uh, with the with the lunge was to do. Uh, if you've ever seen the LSVT protocol, LSVT big is kind of like the LSVT uh, lunge. Yeah. I, yeah. I wasn't really being concerned. But yeah, that, that it was like this, and it's a little bit of a coordination. And as you switch to the next one, you bring your hands in and go out again. But the next, the next modification on that is just to keep the hand down, or it's a little easier. Okay. Or if you want, just put them on your hip, put them on your hips. But yeah, yeah I wasn't see. really, I wasn't really cueing on that or consistent with that. But yeah, um, yeah, LSBT big emphasizes, and it's very, very good. Uh, big movements, and um, you know, like like I say, a lot of times. Uh, well, in, in the book to um, talk about, there are a lot of great programs for Parkinson's out there, but I, I, I really find a lot of them are incomplete. And it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, they're not doing great things because there's no program doing anything bad. Let me tell you that right now. Okay. Rock steady boxing is doing, especially it depends on the coach you have, you know, I mean, take somebody like Melissa Tafoya out in um, Northern Cal and, you got you got the optimal situation, man. You just can't you can't beat it. You got the best coach doing a great program, and she knows why she does what she does, and why it's good for the brain, and why it retrains the brain, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But um, so because I get excited, uh, I need to stop being excited and take that excitement and turn it into productivity, which means I need to get back to the slideshow. So I want to show you. Actually, I want to get to a screen here. Um, I want to talk about. 
you know, walking. Um, well, I had some poles. Here they are. Um, I'm not a sales guy, but I can tell you this: at Parkinson's Regeneration Training .com, If you go there to the featured products link, uh, you get 10% off on these poles. Okay. So um, the activator poles is kind of hard to see. There it is. Because the way my lighting is in here. Um, so basically, there are a lot of studies around using poles for walking. And I want to show you something that I did with somebody recently who works, who has uh, PPMS, which is primary progressive uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, we're going to go to here. Now, I'm showing you this because, and I'm sorry, uh, just bear with me for a second because. I'll get there, folks, I promise. Um, here we go. This person, I use the polls for a lot of different things. I use the polls for a lot of different things. I'm gonna to try to make the screen big for you here. Can you, is that a big screen right now, folks? Hopefully. Watch the use of the polls here. They just add a little steadiness, and they're be it's better than using a cane. Watch, watch here with no poles. Watch the level of difficulty. And I'm going to stop it for a minute because I want you to know that this gentleman, who I can't reveal who he is and I can't show his face because of some job issues potentially, what I can tell you is this: um, he could not stand there and do the reactive light training without poles. He also cannot walk uh, over the hurdles as well without poles. But watch throughout the video and see what happens with poles when he goes over the hurdles. I'm pausing so you can hear me. Watch with the poles going over these things. It's a big difference from what you saw without poles. I actually can't see it. Oh, you can't? I don't know if other people can. Oh, I am seeing the screen of the book. Yes, other people have the problem. Okay. Oh, no. I'm really sorry. Yeah, we're, uh, seeing the, we're seeing the Parkinson's Regeneration Training book screen. Oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, I don't know what happened. I have no idea. Let me go to stop sharing and start something over again here. Uh, let's go back and see if we can look at another thing now. What about uh, what about oh boy? So for those of you who have been with us before, you know that we just started doing these, and this is my fourth webinar that I've hosted, and I'm learning. But I'll tell you, man, it's it's been a kind of a challenge to. Uh, can you see a screen now? Computer, internet? It's it's uh yes, yeah, it's, it's a it's a web browser with the ah, generation training. You can see that, okay. Then then we're just gonna look at something else for a minute. Uh let's let's go right down. We saw dots, we're looking at dots here. When we look at another use of poles that I can show you is the tandem arm swing. Okay, if you have somebody having difficulty, hopefully you can see. Can you see this video okay? There's the screen. I can. Okay, so watch this person. This was recorded in Killeen, Texas. I am behind my person who has Parkinson's and I'm driving the arm swing with poles. Now they're not urban poles, but they're poles, but I use the urban poles for these because it's handies, right? But this is another way where we can take somebody with minimal to, uh, let's, and there's Heather, she's the owner of the business there. She's amazing, amazing trainer, Heather on the left. Um, 
we can take somebody with minimal arm swing or no arm swing and start to drive the arm string from the back. Reciprocal arm swing, realize, right? So this has been a very effective way to uh, work with, I'll just show you one other example. That's not a good one really, but um, this was in, uh, this is a year place, Russ. Yeah. And I don't remember, is her name Helen? Yes, and uh, her, uh, that's her daughter Sue is with me at the Y. Now her arms aren't in the best position because they're not, you know, her elbows are flexed a little bit much, but I remember as we went through though, and there's a rod, oh cool. I remember her name because that's my mother's name. So that's just, uh, you get the idea, right? I'm not gonna belabor that and go on and on with it. Um, but we also have, I, I, I wanted to um, try something with everybody here and I'm gonna make myself larger for a minute here. Okay, what I'd like you to do is like Russ said, Balance, I'm not in the optimal situation to show you, but you're gonna see my compression stock tan lines because I wear socks so I don't get blood clots because I tend to clot up too often. So I want you to, barefoot training is a big part of our program. And if you were with us on a previous webinar or in a workshop, you know that the skin on the bottom of the feet is highly, populated with sensory nerve receptors that are gone dormant because of wearing shoes and socks too much. So if you don't have your shoes off and your socks off, I hope you'll take them off. You can do this without your shoes and socks, or with your shoes and socks on. But what I'd like you to do, if you can, wait, I can get back far enough. I have a little, I have a counter here. You can see my hand here while I'm, I've got a dresser here. So what I'd like you to do is slightly bend your knees, hold on to something if you need to. Now this is a slight bend, okay? It's not like this, just a slight bend. And I want you to either do a kickstand stance, which is probably better to start with. Kickstand stance, let's just put the right leg back. What I want you to do now with that left knee slightly bent is I want you to dig your toes into the ground with all your might, all five toes, just boom. What you'll see when I do this, you're gonna see the arch of my foot go up a little bit, right? Boom. It's called short foot. What happens is the muscles in the bottom of the feet, so let's dig the toes in again, ready? Dig it in, we're gonna hold it for 10 seconds. I'm counting with my hands. It shortens up the abductor hallucis muscle, which is specially connected all the way up to your core, through your uh, legs, up into your butt, and into your abs, all right? Now just relax. Now dig it in again. See the arch come up? You should feel some muscles tensing up in here, up in here, and if you have your knee bent, you might start to feel it in your glute a little bit at some point, all right? So I have a person I'm working with in Canada and a couple others uh, around who have poles. And like I said, I'm not a sales guy, but I love the poles. Because if, you, if, if it's more optimal, you can take the poles, maybe bring the leg right up, then dig the foot in, okay? Another exercise, let's switch sides. Let's go to the right side. We can progress. We can go squat down slightly, all right? Dig the toes in at the bottom and then come back up. Now relax your toes. Watch the arch of my foot right here. Watch this arch. So come down, doesn't have to be a lot. Dig the toes in, watch the arch go up. Now stand back up, relax, come down, dig in. Come up. One more time. Relax at the top. Come on down. Now, dig it in. Boom. Up. These poles are holding me. I had a hip replacement right side six, seven months ago. I'm doing really, really well, but it is a little bit hard for me to do this 
for too many reps without something to hold on to. So I've been using the poles. I also use them when I hike. Uh, where's my chair? I'm gonna move along. I wanna talk about a couple other things here that are relative to reducing fall risk. Let's check the chat box real quick, what we got. Thank you. 821 now. Good, yeah, 821, okay. Yeah, we're, we'll try to end at 830, okay? Because I have a couple of things that I need to do and I don't want to keep you guys all night. All right, so, um, stopping the sharing right now. We got to get back to, uh, no, we are starting the sharing. I need to show you a couple slides. All right, so hopefully you can see the, Can you see the short foot slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So what just happened there is if, if you look, this is flat, this is just resting foot dome length, right? So you dig the toes in, it shortens up this abductor hallucis. It brings uh, the ball of the foot a little bit closer, look at the measurement, to the heel through the contraction of that muscle, which is specially connected all the way up to your core. So it's called foot to core sequencing. It comes from Dr. Emily Splickle. I used to teach for her evidence-based fitness academy. I taught level one and two barefoot training specialist programs. And it's really, really awesome stuff. In the full workshop, we go through all this uh, foot biomechanics stuff because I, I didn't tell you Russ, I added that because I think it's really important. We also talk about the benefits of barefoot stimulation. And it's not just being barefoot. Um, our good friend who's on with us here, Sylvie, I want to at some point have you as a guest so you can talk on a webinar about your experience using power plate because we use um, sensory input tools like Naboso insoles made by Dr. Emily's company, Naboso Technologies, that provided fantastic stimulation and results in helping people to move better because the more input you get into the brain, the more input or output to help you stabilize and move better and reduce fall risk. But we also talk about this whole foot to core sequencing thing, which is very, very important. And uh, Sylvie also does a stimulation with the whole body vibration amongst a million other things that she's so knowledgeable of. And uh, Sylvie, we'll talk soon, okay? Because it would be loved, uh, really great to have you come on. So when we're looking at, um, we've talked about this a lot, and this will be a separate webinar at some point about multitasking training, but just the real simple thing here is, you know, when Russ was doing the tango, he had you doing something you may not have done ever or in a long time. We know that your substantia nigra, the part that is losing brain cells in the uh, person with Parkinson's and in the brain uh, that is a high, you know, produ produces a lot of dopamine, well, that area is losing brain cells, not as much dopamine is produced, but it is still working to some degree, but your brain will outsource now to other areas, okay? It'll outsource to the cerebellum, maybe the frontal areas, and um, help them to create new neural firing patterns, new neural firing pathways. It's like riding a bicycle. When you learn, you didn't, you didn't know how to do it at first, but as you do it and do it and get good at it, your brain makes connections just like this, these webs and webs of neural firing patterns, electrical synapses that happen because these neurons that fire together, wire together, right? So the brain does have the ability very much to adapt as it needs and reorganize and create these pathways so you can develop new skills. This is going to help you. The cognitive training is going to help so much doing a, a movement with a cognitive task on top of it, that can be done in dance. If you're counting while you're dancing, like Russ was counting, well, he's good at it. But, you know, it might be hard for some people in the counting and he's cueing while he's doing it. I know when I am uh, drumming, when I was a drummer and I had to explain things as I was playing, like, you know, whatever I had to dictate rhythmically, it was hard to talk. I don't know how drummers sing and, you know, play all at the same time. I never did that because I'm a terrible singer. But it all has to do with multitasking, doing two things at the same time or more. And that's another webinar we can go into at some point. Um, but one of our favorite fall reduction techniques or concepts, if you will, would be this cognitive training. 
by challenging a person with PD or whoever, anybody, you know, my mother or me, anybody, to implement the cognitive training during a focus, focus movement. Because when it want to improve the movement skills, um, develop these skills so that they transfer. This is the whole thing. This this book was written so you could learn stuff, implement it, so that it transfers from here to your practice to your everyday life. We don't just want you to come in and do stuff and then have it not benefit you. The whole idea is to benefit you outside of the training area, wherever you are. Um, oh, I guess I, that slide is in there twice. Whoa, ADD kicked in. Uh, so the more we do it, basically, the more it's gonna, uh, the, the more we do something, the more, the better we get usually because those neurons keep firing and they, they make a more solid pathway, a more solid connection. They just keep connecting and connecting and connecting. And I've actually literally fallen asleep drumming maybe for like eight seconds, you know, but like, and the bass players over there like, because it wasn't at a wedding and playing a boring song that I didn't like and whatever. But I was just going because I wasn't even consciously thinking about it, you know. Do you think about your car every moment you're driving of where you're going? You ever miss an exit because you're daydreaming? Your brain is working, man. It's like all these things are just so well developed that you're like, mm, you're driving, you're not even thinking about it. So, uh, you know, ride a bike, drive a car, learn a language. I'm learning Spanish now. Again, I'm doing well. Learn a new skill, learn an instrument, learn anything, something new. Because the more you can learn and develop these pathways in your brain, especially while you're moving, the less like you are to fall. Um, I, I, we're we're going to end soon, but I, I want Russ to talk to us too. I'm just going to say one more time, remember that every penny of the book, $35, it goes all, pro, it costs $21 to produce the book. So $14 goes to uh, foundation and you know, if you take 14 times 10 book sales, that could supply somebody for many months of medications. And I really, really hope that you'll consider going to the pdbookbook.com and buy a copy because you'll have a resource that's huge and you'll have a free forever access to a growing website that will just keep developing and developing and uh, interactive place for people. Um, so, I hope you'll go and you'll check that out. Um, if you need me, my email's not on here, but it's carl at neuromotortraining.com. Visit our website, um, buy the book, pdbook.com. And I'm going to unpin myself. Russ, my friend, you can do anything you want, man. I, uh, you really wanted, wanted to do some more movement if you have another move, I and I know we're going over time, but this will be sent to everybody. So, Rush, you got anything you um, want to do before they, we? End? They may not have. They may not have the equipment, but um, we could do the infinity walk, or I could show them a vestibular thing. Just oh, please, yeah, I, we meant to do that. Oh, by the way, folks, uh, Sylvie just mentioned mentioned a vibrating roller, and she's got power plate. Uh, this hypersphere vibrating ball is one of my favorites. This is a side note, it doesn't have to do with falling, but if you turn this on, it's spinning on its own now. I've got it on high speed, but we have had people hold it in their hands for maybe five minutes, and their tremor may go from this to sometimes nothing. It's a temporary fix, but you know what? Maybe it allows them to be able to type, text, write, eat, button a shirt, whatever. So vibration is a really cool thing that we talk about in our full workshop. Remember that's August 8th, August 9th, 10 to 5 each day. You get CEUs for $249, Parkinson's Regeneration Brain Training.com. Russ, go. <laughs> He's gonna do the infinity walk, right? Russ, you're muted, and I'm gonna pin you in unmute. I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, I'm going to just do one quick walking thing. It'll take like two seconds to demonstrate. Set up like, like a cone about 15 feet away. You're going to get up. You're going to walk. You're going to go, as you're walking, you're going to count by sevens or nines. So we'll do seven.
seven four and turn. Keep going, turn around, go around the column, and sit down, and you're gonna do the same thing. So that's just, I just wanted to demonstrate, it's just a simple thing like walking, getting a cognitive task to a movement. So I just want to do that quick example. And the reason I actually brought, brought, brought that one up is that's actually was part of a re research where they, they tested out like four other similar types of things. Um, but none of them included adding in the, uh, the cognitive part of while you're doing while you're doing the walking and that was the one that showed the best results on uh um you know like um, improvement of symptoms especially like that and, and gait issues so vestibular um but we're gonna do we'll do infinity walk right so you could just if you don't have any sort of targets you could just look anywhere but i I'm, i have these agility dots i'm gonna put two down on here I just want to make sure you can see it. And then a red one. You can barely see that. Yeah. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in a figure eight pattern, and there's going to be another dot, blue dot, over there. And I'm going to walk in a figure eight pattern. So you walk in a figure eight, just pick a distance, you know, maybe about five feet apart. And as I'm walking, I'm going to constantly be looking at this dot on the side. Keep looking, I'm looking, and this works your vestibular system called the infinity walk. That's basically all you do. Um, there's a bunch of different things you could do with the vestibular system, and a lot of it has to do with moving your moving your head or moving your and looking at a target or, or just moving your eyes and keeping your head. So another one that you could do is you could do a you could do a movement or, or you just balance on one foot and you can look to the side back and forth and you could and it to it also you keep looking at a target looking at a target and then that counting again or recalling something uh, coming up with a list of things so uh, um, Dom Dominica I just wanted to if you're still with us um, actually I, let me just check and see because I don't want to take a people's time if someone's not here. But I wanted to say that, um, yes, she's still here. Okay, Dominique, I wanna say that uh, one of the things that I, I learned this infinity walk itself from Dr. Perry Nicholson. He actually wrote the foreword for my book. A lot of you probably heard of him. He's, uh, well, you, you probably saw it because you have the book, which I thank you for. And Sylvie too, thank you as well um, for buying the book. Uh, I combine two things here. Perry teaches the Infinity Walk, which actually was developed by uh, Dr. Deborah Sunbeck, who lives about an hour from me, and we're trying to get together and have coffee one day. But the book is called The Infinity Walk, and I believe it's out of print. But you can get anything out of print if you look. I found it, and it's out of print. It's a used copy. But it's a really good book. It even talks about how the Infinity Walk can help to take like an asymmetrical mouth shape and kind of or facial you know muscular things and eventually practicing enough over weeks and weeks can help to even out uh, symmetrical positions on the face you know nothing's guaranteed and doesn't work for everybody all the time however there are many benefits so when perry teaches this he and when ruth uh deborah sunbeck teaches it they do exactly what russ did you're looking at one dot while you're walking around the other dots in a figure eight pattern. So I'll progress this with people where I'll have them go forward, keep looking at the dot, and then when they get over here, they start walking backwards around to the first dot. And then I'll have them uh, with Jerry and a couple others. Jerry, if you don't know him, you probably do if you watch my posts. My first person I ever worked with who lives with Parkinson's started eight years ago with him. And I just saw him uh, a couple days ago. And we did this. So what we did is we went, uh, he goes backwards all the way around and does, it looks at the dot. So what's happening there though, and this, this is what Perry and Deborah teach, but also it gets into Marcus Ernst and some of his stuff is when you're turning the head, well, first of all, you're moving, right? You got a focused movement, figure eights, forward, backward, half forward, half backward, whatever. But now your head is turning because 
you're um, looking at the dots, so your head is forced to turn. It activates the vestibular system, but your eyes are also tracking. So now your eyes are going, which activates the vestibular system simultaneously with the vestibular, uh, visual vestibular together while you're doing focus movement. Then you can throw on some kind of, uh, you know, count by sevens. Uh, tell me the capital of Texas. Austin, great. Spell it forwards. Spell it backwards. Say the alphabet backwards. Do math equations. Name your favorite cars. A name, how do you spell your models of your favorite cars? And name, name every muscle car in the 60s. Like, you know, because I'm a muscle car guy. So, I mean, but just come up with cognitive challenge. And what that does, according to Marcus Ernst, at Colorado, Brains, uh, uh, Colorado Springs Brain Center is it stimulates even deeper in the brain. Um, you could even do it if somebody's not able to walk um, the figure eight, they could even do it sitting on a stability ball. And I actually don't have it with me. I developed this little thing where I, I have a, a headpiece, I have a, a laser pointer in it, and I just hold it on, I put it on, and then it stays on. So now the laser's pointing on the wall, and the person's sitting on a proprioceptively enriched seat, a stability ball. So they have a little bit of, you know, um, instability, but it's pretty easy to control. And now they're drawing a figure eight on the wall in front of them. This I learned from Marcus. So they got eyes tracking, they got head moving. So now you have the same things happening and then you throw on a cognitive thing like, you know, name every kitchen appliance you can think of. As you name them, spell them. Or every body part. There's so many different ways to activate. It. What it is, the key to this is the activation of this vestibular visual during a focus movement and a cognitive exercise on top of it will get deeper brain stimulation and it just, it helps even more. It helps even more than certainly doing a crossword puzzle or something like that or some kind of video game. There's nothing wrong with those. Actually, some of the 3D video games are really cool, especially if you're interactive and you're moving around physically. That can be cool as long as you're safe. So um, we could go on for hours. But I want to just check and see if there's any questions. Um, ask away. Friends, thank you for hanging on so long. A lot of you are still here who started, only a few left. Dominica, Sophie, Ann, Laura, Ed. Ed, I'm gonna reach out to you about the um, martial arts thing. Somebody's asking about more books to recommend? Any oh. Books, any other books? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, you, are you ready for this? Here's a stack. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Seriously, you look it up? I know you I got have, a lot of them. I have many. Uh, and that's not all. Get this one. Barefoot Strong by Dr. Emily Splickle, a good friend and a mentor. She just moved to Arizona, too. She lives there now. She was in Manhattan for a long time. Barefoot Strong, Emily Splickle. This one could also be called The End of All uh, Parkinson's, but it's called The End of Alzheimer's. I met this gentleman, he actually gave me this book when I was at a Maria Shriver function, having lunch with Maria and this gentleman and a couple others, Dale Bredesen, Southern Cal. Yes, Sammy, please stay on for another couple of minutes. Let's talk about, um, okay, Sue, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Sue, I'll see you tomorrow at one. Um, this is an amazing book. John Rady, he wrote many books. This one talks about BDNF in the brain. It's called Spark. John Rady, Harvard uh, neuropsychiatry professor at the medical school. He also wrote this one called Go Wild. Remember, you're going to get a re recording of this, so you can go to the end and you can just jot these down. Go Wild is fantastic. Talks about all kinds of stuff. Software, M Michael uh, Mazernik. Mazernik. Michael Merzenich is a genius. This is a really good book, Softwire. It talks about the, uh, the brain. This is your brain on music, Dr. Dale Levison. I have four of his books, but I only have one right here. This is great, Power of Music in the Brain. You already saw Infinity Walk. The only other one I have with me, but there's, there's two books by this person. 
the brain that changes itself by Dr. Norman Deutsch is really good, but this is the follow-up called The Brain's Way of Healing by Norman Deutsch. And if you, that has one of the best chapters on Parkinson's disease I've ever read, and Alzheimer's as well. Um, he talks about John Pepe from South Africa, who has had Parkinson's at this point for probably like 45 years. One of the things I write, write about in my book is based on that, and I use citations in that for uh, uh, mindful movement. And I won't go into it now, but if you buy the book, you'll know. <laughs> Sorry. The pdbook.com. Oh, of course, there's this book too. All right. So this book is really kind of like a lot of all the stuff I just showed you with the highlights in here. Uh, the bibliography in this book is actually quite long because there's so many different books and resources. I mean, I think it's 18 pages long in the biography. Uh, Sammy, let's talk about MSA real quick. Uh, MSA is a very, uh, the answer is yes, I do use the same techniques and I use them with everyone where they have a movement disorder or not, if they can. Okay, if they can. You can only, when I give the example, Russ showed us Infinity Walk, but I talk about sitting on a stability ball and doing this with a laser pointer or just doing this, you know, imaginary drawing a thing on the wall. You could do that too. You don't have to have a laser pointer, but um, if somebody's at high risk of falling and doing that walk is dangerous, then have them sit. So that's for anybody, no matter who they are, it's individualized based on what they can do. But yes, um, MSA is really, there. as far as I know, I think there are two forms, the cerebral and the Parkinsonian form. And I don't know which one is worse. I work with people with each, but I just know that they're both very aggressive. They're very bad. They're very fast moving. And the, the, the people I worked with, they were fighters. They did all this stuff um, and all the floor movements. They would do those things um, as they could. Some days they couldn't, but yes, I, it doesn't matter. You know, dyskinesia, ataxia, MS. I have more MS people right now than I do people with Parkinson's, but it tends to shift back and forth. Even, you know, I work a lot with people with learning disabilities, and we find that the gamification of this is really good in, in, in that arena, but really everybody seems to like to gamify things. I'm a kid, you know, I'm just a nerdy kid and I love games, so I like to gamify everything that I can. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. But feel free to reach out to me too, Sammy, um, please, we can talk. I have videos I could send you with people with MSA doing various things from anywhere from very confined to a wheelchair only to walking around with assistance and things like that. Yes, Puerto Rico. Yes, let's do it. I think, Russ, anything you wanna say? No, just uh, everyone just keep challenging yourself. And you know, there's that, that fine line again between the safety and then challenging yourself enough to change. So try to find that, that good um, middle ground, a good place, find some things to start with and then keep progressing. And uh, the more you move, the more you move differently, the more you'll fire up your brain uh, and help your movement. Okay, Miriam, thank you, Miriam, for coming. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Russ, for what you just said and for everything you share and you bring, to, you know, without you, this organization wouldn't even be close to what it is now. You've added so much, and I really thank you. Being so part much. Of and Melissa, thank you. So I'll tell you what, I've never, ever not gone over, so we're over by a half an hour. I'm sorry, um, but I think I'll just have to make longer time periods for these. And, Instead of 7 to 8.15, it's like 7 to 8.45. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. Thank you, everyone. Russ, thanks, man. I'll talk to you thank tomorrow. You, okay. Take Dominica, care. Thank you. We'll be in touch, too. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.